Dorothea will now present the second session of uh, her presentation at the Transformation Marathon. Dorothea is documenta professor at the Art Academy and University of Kassel. Um, she was very instrumental in our exhibition on Cedric Price and Lucius Burkhardt, a stroll through a fun palace at the Venice Biennale in the Swiss Pavilion last year, where Dorothea presented a series of vignettes. So it was a book written in the process of making the exhibition and is actually currently working related to that on a book that explores exhibitions as ritual spaces in which fundamental values and categories of modern liberal and market-based societies historically have been and continue to be practiced and reflected. And it's fascinating that Dorothea mentioned in relation to that research also the idea to go beyond this idea of being limited to only the visual primacy. Margaret Mead early on criticized already in the 50s that sort of visual domination of the exhibition and encouraged a more multi-sensory approach and that meets wonderfully what Mary Bauermeister told us earlier today. So the ritual of the exhibition appealing to all the senses. Dorothea is the author of How to Do Things with Art, the book on performativity within contemporary art. And we are deeply grateful to Dorothea for all the conversation during this marathon. And please give Dorothea von Handelmann a very, very warm welcome back. Thank you so much. Yeah, I started with um, earlier today in the morning with the curiosity cabinets of the 16th century, and I will try to end uh, with um, actually Cedric Fr Price's Fun Palace, which is quite a run through uh, a couple of centuries. But um, the idea of that was to present you, uh, which is sort of my main argument, the, the exhibition, the museum, the format of the exhibition in modern, Western, modern, democratic, liberal, market-based society as something like uh, modern in the sense of liberal, individualized ritual. And um, the idea was to present different stages and how this, showing how this emerged in order to actually now, um, at the end of my talk today, uh, this evening, give you an idea of what I think this should, could or should transform to in the 21st centuries. So, um, yeah, we, let's see, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I spoke at length uh, this morning about museum as ritual, so as sort of quasi-temples, uh, we cross a threshold, um, we elevate ourselves from the everyday world only to encounter on the other side of this threshold, uh, a cultivation or an elevation of precisely those fundamental categories that underlie our modern everyday world, which is the idea of the individual. Historically, the museum is very important in the emergence of individualization and providing a, a space, a cultural format that explicitly addresses the individual as an individual, the idea to of encounter, encountering an artwork, artwork is, a, is conceived to be a one-on-one -on -one experience um, as opposed to, as you all know, theater and all sort of historical cultural formats um, where, that, are, that address the collective, huh? the, the, the body of the people. And here we have a, a sort of individualized, flexibilized cultural format. You come and go as you like, you decide yourself how much time you spend on each artwork and so on. So a valorization of the individual, but the individual in relation to a material object. So that's like the the, 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 the nexus of bourgeois culture, the individual that sort of distinguishes him or herself in relation to a material thing. This nexus integrated in an evolutionary understanding of time, a, a narration of progress, of development. You start somewhere in the historical periods and you end in the present. And the circulation of these object on a, objects on a market. So we have the individual, the material, the produced object, a narration of progress, and a, a, a sort of market-based commodity status of these objects, which are like four pillars of modern Western societies that the exhibition format brings in, in a relation to each other. And this relation changes over time. And, and all this constitutes um, a, a cultural format that is somehow ritually in, uh, consumed. Um, 
uh, that is modern because it's 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 liberal, as I said, but it's also secular. We don't we don't um, we don't knee down and pray to these um, Madonna uh, paintings anymore. Like this is a caricature from the early days of museums where peasants who came from the countryside to the museums didn't know how to behave. So they knee down and sort of sticked to the old uh, cultural ritual yeah? um, instead of uh, instead of judging the painting, instead of trying to understand it. Uh, so instead of sort of enacting a rationalized um, uh, relation to them. Uh, so what I, what I want to do now is speak, about, speak a little bit about how this has transformed in the 19th and 20th century. Um, what, has hap what, what could we say has happened between these two um, images? Um, well, the space on the left is ornamented, decorated, full, basically, yeah? full of paintings and um, hung closed together in several rows. Visitors look at these paintings in, in alone in pairs and groups. They are walking and stopping. They are chatting and conversing. So we see an overall presentation with no focus on individual objects. In fact, if someone wanted to um, look at one of the paintings more closely, he had to turn to a guard who would use a ladder to remove the painting from the wall and place it on a small easel. On the right, um, by contrast, we see an exhibition space that no longer has this uniform presentation. It is a cleared space, we could say. No ornament, no decoration, anything that was, would suggest a period atmosphere, wall coverings um, or accessories has been removed. So more than the other space, this space provides a setting that fosters arts and its, its experience as something segregated from other spheres of life. Um, we could, as I, as I already said this morning, we could actually narrate the whole history of progressive individualization um, as the decisive social dynamic of modern societies along the increase of wall space uh, between paintings and exhibition spaces in 19th and 20th century uh, museums. So on the right hand, uh, you, you see the, how the, the, the overload of objects has yielded to the um, autonomous work whose isolation on the wall corresponds to an um, individualized, equally sort of singled out uh, visitor. Um, so when we walk through this wide cube, we are not sort of subjected to a canon anymore. We encounter the, we could say, the subjectivity of an individualized artist materialized in a singularized uh, painting. So more than anything, the white cube is a flexible space, a disconnected space, uh, in which the objects can be presented in ever new and ever changing context, just as the modern individual exists in no permanent, no stable relations, but only in multiple ever changing ones. What then happened um, on an economic level between these two pictures uh, on the left and on the right is the transformation from early market societies that cultivate their production capacity. You see this in this picture, it's sort of all about quantity, um, into early consumer societies. So what basically happened is the emergence of supply markets. Well, the, the, the emergence of, of affluence, of, of, of supply markets, of um, uh, a slow sort of emerging process of, um, of, 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 of a consumer society. What characterizes this consumer society is um, a need to address. Yeah? When supply exceed demands, the, the issue of addressing, of presenting, of marketing or propaganda, as it was called in its early days, becomes more important. Huh? Things have to be marketed. They have to, be, they have to have an effect. They have to be charged with intensity, with subjectivity, in a sense. We also, for the few of you who have been here this morning, we spoke about that in, a, in the very early rays of, an, of a consumer um, culture in, uh, in the early modern period already. So consumption mean, essentially means the entanglement of objecthood with subjectivity, one could say. It means the growing need to vest objects which, with something like 
subjectivity. So out of, out of an oversupply of products, let's say sneakers in a Nike shop or something, um, that hardly differ anymore in their function, um, you select the one that you think matches the most or does the most to the differentiation of your own subjectivity. So the generation or the differentiation of your sub sub subjectivity becomes the actual function, one could say, of, um, of this product. And in that sense, one could even say that the artwork is like the, the prime product of that time because it doesn't even pretend to have a use value. It's only there to differentiate, differentiate your, your subjectivity. And precisely this connection between objecthood and subjectivity is materialized and cultivated, sort of brought to a higher level in, th in the white cube of the 20th century. It sort of paradigmatically shows how things can produce and be charged with subjectivity. As, as David Riesmann, the American sociologist, already noted in the 1950s, consumers relate less to the things in themselves than to their content as experience and event. And interestingly, at the same time as he's saying this, in, in the white cube, these experiential spaces emerge. Huh? These abstract paintings that produce something like a pure experientiality, um, which is designed to confront the individual visitor or viewer with his or her own individual levels and shades of experience. So we could say, I mean, this is a long story that I'm, I'm breaking up in very small, brief chunks here, but on the left hand, the, the, the wealth of objects in the 19th century museum corresponds or materializes the, the, the categorical relationships that signify an early market-based society. In German, there's, there's a word, I don't even know if it exists, uh, it probably doesn't, but I really like to use it, uh, which means to make, to, to place something in time and in space, the process of making something spatially and, and temporarily concrete. Yeah? And you could say that the space is a, is a Verraumzeitlichung, a sort of spatialization, temporalization of these very abstract categories that needed a space to be acted out, to be habitu habitualized, to be cultivated. Huh? And this is what I mean when I speak of these spaces as, as, as having a ritual, as fulfilling a very um, fundamental ritualistic function. They are not co just containers. Yeah? They, are, they are spaces that are used and that fulfill a very elementary function. And on the right side, um, the, something else is materialized, the essential parameters of this earlier developing consumer society. So <clears throat> to conclude this part, we could say that the, that, um, the, 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 the museum the format of the exhibition um, corresponds or mirrors very basic categories of, socio, of the socioeconomic order of Western societies. And to the extent, I, I think I said this this morning, to the extent that these societies understand themselves as being liberal, as being open, as being constantly transforming and progressive, the um, format of the exhibition has to constantly progress and transform itself in order to stay what it always was, um, a, a contemporary liberal ritual. And, and the reason why this could somehow work quite well, I mean, in museums, this format became inc incredibly successful and popular and charged with a lot of money and attention and, and legitimation is because the white cube could, as, uh, could adjust to the changes of this socioeconomic a premises of the consumer society. The question that we are facing today now is um, if it can still adjust to the situation of the 21st century. Because the problem we face, and this is sort of categorically different, is, is less or not, not so much anymore to liberate ourselves from pre-existing social rigid ties, yeah? like it was the case when museums emerged, the idea to liberate from, from a sort of close cosmology, from a rigid sort of pre-modern uh, uh, social structure, but, but rather um, being confronted today with the economic, social, and, 
and, and ecological consequences of this imperative of liberalism and separation, how things can be, can be brought back together, how to create ties or, uh, or moments of connectivity and how to cultivate those without giving up individualization and flexibility. Yeah? So how to, to, to create this, this paradox, one could say, yeah? of, 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 of creating a structure, a ritual that allows for moments of connectivity without returning to what I introduced this morning as the classical format of the one speaking to the many as in theater, as, as all historical cultural formats were based on. I mean, we could say today that this is an extremely sort of liberal um, event in terms of its content, but in terms of its format, it's quite traditional. It's the one that speaks to the many. Huh? So there's a sort of a gap between the format and the content, and this is something that, that I think is interesting when, if, if one reflects on, on the question of formats. So back to the exhibition, because when it comes to thinking in modalities of connection, the exhibition clearly reaches structural limits because a format that historically was geared to flexibilize ties can only to a certain extent produce modalities of connection and being connected, which is something that all statistics and uh, of, of, of museum visitor and the duration of their attention the fo they focus to an individual artworks proof. Huh? It's usually like 1.7 seconds in average or something. Anyway, um, of course, I mean, the individual visitor can create moments of connectivity, but it's not something that the format structurally as such encourages. Hmm? So it seems that, was his, that what, in a sort of cultural historical perspective, was the strength of this format, its focus on on a liberal format, on, uh, on flexibility and individuality, under today's conditions runs the risk of turning into a weakness. So this, I think, is where a, a reflection on transformation um, in relation to the exhibition format today would need to start. Um, which is very different from all 20th century avant-garde attacks on museums or on ideas on sort of merging life and art together or giving up the different um, disciplines or something, genres of art. So what I, what I mean is actually the, 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 the attempt to work on the invention or transformation of, 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 of something like a new ritual, indeed in the sense or... Um, sort of inspired by what Margaret Mead wrote in 1942 in her essay, Art and Reality, I think it is called, uh, which is a fierce attack on the concept, on the modern concept of art and exhibition, which for her is a, a rather poor ritual because it addresses, it, it cannot address the, the, the human being as a whole, as a rational, uh, uh, reflective, but also as an embodied, and spiritual being. It, it cannot spark any sort of energies that go beyond the rational or the, the worldly, let's say, the this worldly, towards the spiritual or towards transcendence. Um, and of course, from, what, from all that we've said here earlier, well, one could say that meat doesn't, um, market meat doesn't recognize the cultural achievement that the invention of this format um, as, as, as a liberal ritual was, but still in terms of the construction or composition of a ritual, she's right. Um, what this ritual can achieve on a, as a ritual remains on a relatively low level. Um, so, to, to say it again, the crucial question concerning exhibitions today would thus be how to create a form that is able to create ties or connective elements and that still stays t attuned to a contemporary individualized and flexibilized um, sensitivity. And with this in mind, I want to, um, oh, sorry, this I wanted to show you before. It's, it's again about this sort of history of individualization that you can sort of narrate along the, the increase of wall space. But anyway, um, uh, 
Yeah, with this in mind, I want to I want to very briefly turn to two examples. One is um, a number of exhibitions, because also because Hans Ulrich mentioned it in his introduction here, um, uh, that the, that came up in the in the late 90s already. The the um, as a new sort of exhibition format, which the time based exhibition and two of these um, exhibitions by Henri Sala and Philippe Pareno have been held here at the Serpentine. So I I assume many of you have seen them. Time is a vital factor in these exhibitions, um, which uh, are exhibitions that turn time into a structuring, uh, explicit structuring element of the exhibition, so that the ex exhibition de facto changes in time, thereby creating its own time into which the, the, the viewer is drawn, um, which creates a new format that one could call maybe something like an individualist individualized space for events no? and a very hybrid format because they are yeah they are hybrid between exhibition and event spaces so between um, they are spaces that in their on the one hand are timed events they are timed exhibitions no? they are they follow uh, the, they have a temporal modality um, and, and in that they are close to a to a theatrical live event things happen there in time but in their mode of addressal, they stay attuned to a liberal and individualized principle of the exhibition. They keep the liberal framework of the opening hours. They don't return to the modality of the appointment. We spoke about that this morning. Visitors are grouped, but they are grouped in rather loose um, temporary clusters and not in a fixed collective. And the collectivity that they, that they generate is relatively loose and liberal in, in comparison to theater or cinema. Um, so this is one example that I would like to, to, to refer to here, and the other is, is actually, um, yeah, since it has been mentioned here a few times already today, um, is Cedric Price's Fun Palace, which, um, as probably many of you know, is, a, is, a, is an idea from, from the early 60s um, that has never been realized, but that, uh, not yet at least, but... Um, has been very influential and inspiring for existing cultural institutions such as, such as uh, the, the Centre Pompidou in Paris, for instance. Um, interesting about this, the, the Fun Palace is, is its flexible spatial design that was supposed to be able to transform from, um, from different, from one modality to the other, so from exhibition to event places in a very liberal way. So it was supposed to host close to 60,000 people and somehow, I mean, no one knows how this was supposed to work. They were, they, they, the idea was that they would decide themselves uh, what, what would happen in this, in this space. Um, but it's interesting, I think, to use this as an, as an impulse, as an approach um, to articulate criteria um, for criteria for something like a new cultural format or a new cultural ritual. And, and let me conclude by somehow just trying to assemble a few of these criteria. So what we would need is um, this liberal frame of opening hours huh, that make it possible for a mass society to participate in culture uh, as opposed to the fixed temporal frame of theater. But to, on the other hand, overcome the weakness of this liberal frame, so to connect, to, 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 to make possible moments of, of, of bonding, of connectivity. So the idea of this ritual, of this transformation, transformed ritual would be to interweave different modalities of addressal. Modali the, 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 the modality of the appointment and the modality of opening hours, uh, so to speak. Um, plus, um, to provide a space that relat could, would relativize, oh, and by interweaving these different modes of modalities of addressing, I don't mean it in the way that actual institutions like the Centre Pompidou did it, because they have, I mean, they, 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 have, they pr provide a building where, where different art forms can be gathered, but on different floors. Whereas I'm speaking of a space that is actually, can actually transform from one modality into the other. Um, and second, to relativize the hegemonic position of visual art, uh, to overcome the primacy of the visual object, which 
somehow has been an intermezzo of the last 20 years or so of, of productivist societies that somehow needed to cultivate their production paradigm in, in, in materializing culture and objects, but to provide a space that allows for a focus on, on, on social, on, on a sort of cultivation or, or aesthetic work on the self and on social relations and social interactions. And, and this is maybe the last point, to provide for a space that, that as Margaret Mead says, doesn't def diffract the senses, hmm? like, like visual, the visual art institution did by, by its primacy on, on the sense of the eye huh? for a long time, which is a distancing sense, as we know from sociologists. So this, this could be criteria, I think, for the invention of a, of a cultural format that for, 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 for a contemporary transformation of the exhibition format, although it somehow deviates from the exhibition to such an extent that I don't even know if we would speak of a transformation here or rather of a reinvention, which would then probably need a new name for which I don't really have an idea, have a, have an idea right now. So <laughs> I'll come up with this another time, maybe, or one, one of you maybe could do that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.